All right, uh, thank you very much. The behavior that we're trying to understand is goal-directed attention control, which underlies all the things that we try to do, from uh, making dinner to navigating across town. And understanding this goal-directed control is likely key to understanding any intelligent system, be it human or machine. However, most computational models of attention control predict only free viewing behavior, typically using bottom-up feature contrast to compute saliency maps. And although this is a very active literature, complete with uh, competitions and leaderboards for the best models, keep in mind that all of these models predict attention control mainly from the visual input, which is very different from goal-directed behavior. Of course, people have been studying goal-directed attention for a long time, dating all the way back to the seminal work by Yorbis. And more recently, uh, goal-directed behavior has been studied in tasks such as making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, uh, which is interesting because although this sounds pretty easy, it turns out that uh, people make lots of fixations back and forth between these simple ingredients. And this really challenges uh, uh, understanding this from a, a computational perspective. Our lab studies uh, visual search which is arguably the simplest and therefore best goal-directed behavior to try to figure out. There's a target goal and you're trying to find it. This means that if you show someone an object array and ask them to find the teddy bear, you get a very different behavior than if you ask them to find the butterfly. And in neither case will they prefer to look at the footstool, uh, even though it's the most visually salient object. Instead of object arrays, the work that I'll be talking about today uses images of real-world scenes, mainly kitchens. Uh, but the idea is pretty much the same. So if I uh, show you this scene and ask you to find the clock, uh, you get a pattern of fixations that looks very different than if I asked you to find the microwave oven. And again, uh, neither of these patterns can be explained by saliency models, where even the best of them is kind of all over the place. Search researchers refer to this as target guidance which is the control of attention by a target goal. Surprisingly, and in contrast to the rich literature on bottom-up attention modeling, the modeling of target category search is really, really sparse. And a lot of it is by these dubious Adeli and Zelensky characters. One reason for this is because this is a really hard problem, kind of right at that intersection of attention and recognition research. But another big reason is because there just aren't many data sets of categorical search. And those that do exist all suffer from one problem or another that I'm not going to get into today. But this is important because, as you can see from the saliency benchmark, all the best models of free viewing prediction are now deep networks. And these models require large data sets of free viewing behavior for training. Nothing like this, however, exists for goal-directed attention. That is, until now. So uh, let me uh, detour for a few minutes and tell you about our microwave clock search data set. The data set is built from Microsoft Cocoa. And for those of you who don't know Cocoa, it's a wonderful data set uh, that consists of over 200,000 images of scenes that are segmented into 80 object categories, which is really ideal for um, training deep nets to predict search behavior. By the way, we're about halfway through the creation of Coco Search 10, which is a large-scale effort to behaviorally annotate a big chunk of Coco with goal-directed human fixations, 18 of its categories. And with about 24,000 goal-directed fixations per subject, and with the 10 at the end indicating the number of subjects, uh, this means that you're looking at a quarter million of search fixations. For the modelers out there, your jaws probably dropped a little at the prospect of having all that trading data, I know. Uh, we hope to have Coco Search 10 ready by the CVPR deadline in November, but uh, it's certainly coming soon. Okay, I'm going to stop talking about Coco Search 10, other than to say that uh, in building this data set, we had to start somewhere, and you guessed it, our first two categories were microwaves and clocks. The selection was largely arbitrary. Uh, more important is that two is the uh, critical number that you need to start modeling some basic questions in attention control, such as uh, how attention changes when you're searching for one thing versus another. The vast majority of these images were used for model training. Uh, in creating a large-scale data set, there's always this trade-off between wanting to get as many images as you possibly can, because more is always better, 
and wanting to get good images uh, that will elicit good search behavior. For example, we excluded images that uh, depicted people and animals, even though they had one of the target categories indicated in red. This was a judgment call, but uh, uh, in uh, my opinion, uh, people are just so biased to look at other people and cute animals that mixing these images in with the rest would just create for a really noisy search. We also excluded, what did do? We also excluded uh, digital clocks. Uh, this again was a judgment call, but uh, in our opinion, the features of digital and analog clocks were just too different to lump into the same clock category, so we decided to go with just the uh, analog clocks. This left us with about 1,500 clock images and 689 microwave images, all to use for uh, training. Notice, however, that some of these images are far from ideal. Uh, so the, uh, the clock on the left is uh, right at the center, which is where the search started. Uh, some of the images have multiple exemplars of the target. Over on the right, you have a big honking microwave again at the center. This is that trade-off that I was talking about. In order to have lots of images, you need to tolerate lots of variability in search difficulty. To obtain the behavioral annotation for model training, each clock image was uh, searched by a one to two subjects, and each microwave image was searched by two to three subjects. Uh, this is a bit of a moving target because we're constantly collecting data, uh, but the results that I'll be telling you about today are based on these numbers. So that was the training data set, but there's also a completely disjoint testing data set. Because it's the, fixa uh, the fixation data from these images that we're gonna be trying to predict, uh, we wanted to make sure that they elicit good search behavior, and we did this by introducing several additional constraints. For one, we excluded images that contained multiple instances of the target. We also excluded images if the target was too big or, or if it appeared at the center uh, based on a five by five grid. Finally, and this is the big one, uh, for the test data set, we required each image to depict both a microwave and a clock. And we did this because it's the perfect control for bottom-up saliency. To the extent that we find guidance in both the microwave and clock search behavior, uh, that cannot be explained by the pixel input. It can only be goal-directed attention. But having this control meant uh, tolerating a relatively uh, small uh, test data set of only 40 images, uh, which we tried to compensate for by having a larger pool of 60 subjects, 30 searching for a clock, the other 30 searching the same images for a microwave. There were also an equal number of target absent images, but I'm not gonna talk about these today. A standard uh, categorical search paradigm uh, was used for both uh, training and testing, and trials terminated with a present or absent target response. For the modeling method, we used inverse reinforcement learning, uh, which is a state-of-the-art imitation learning method from the machine learning literature. You can find all the details in uh, this paper here, uh, but very simply, it learns how to make model-generated behavior become more like human behavior. And it does this by rewarding behavior that happens to be more human-like. So uh, bringing this into the context of search, it's basically learning a reward function for mimicking human search fixations. Once this reward function is um, uh, learned, we can then use it to predict the search fixations on the test images. In a sense, uh, attention priority is being reconceptualized as total expected reward. How much reward would be received if gaze went to a particular location? Translating this, why do I, I keep doing that? Uh, translating this into a box model, it looks something like this. Uh, focusing first on model training, uh, it all starts with a generator, or G, and a discriminator, or D, and each of these is a neural network locked in this adversarial process. This is so cool. <laughs> the generator takes an image input and generates a sequence of fixations. So you can think of these as fake eye movements or fake data. Better yet, think of each of these as an action uh, that becomes paired, uh, uh, so, uh, Think of this, uh, each of these as an eye movement, an action that becomes paired uh, with a particular state, mainly the input image, uh, to create what is referred to as a state-action pair. 
But recall that we also have real eye movements from our training data, so there is a real state action pair for the same image. The discriminator then takes the fake data and the real data, and it tries to guess which is which. Uh, so uh, this discrimination initially uh, starts off easy because the generator will be generating random eye movements, but, and this is the secret sauce, each time the discriminator happens to guess wrong, which is bound to happen just uh, probabilistically, that particular state action pair from the generator is rewarded, meaning that it'll be more likely to be generated in the future. So when you iterate this process over all the training data, the generator becomes increasingly good at fooling the discriminator, which means that it's producing increasingly human-like data that is difficult to discriminate from real. And again, this is why it's important to have all those fixations in all those training images, uh, because the more training data you have means the more iterations you have of this adversarial process. So that was model training. Now what about testing? Once the model is trained, what it has learned is a reward function and policy uh, for taking new image inputs and making new sequences of actions, eye movements, uh, which we quantify into uh, what we're calling a saccade map, which essentially is a map of the total expected reward if saccades were to be made to all the different locations uh, in the input image. And I'll show you examples of these in a minute. But for now, I just want to say that the saccade map can be thought of as a priority map, uh, meaning that fixation predictions can be made simply by reading reward values directly from this map. Okay, so that is our model, and um, I'm deliberately avoiding lots of details, but I absolutely have to say something about how we're representing states and actions. The state is the internal representation that is being used for search. And obviously a big part of this will be the features that are extracted from the, in, uh, the input image. Uh, to obtain our core state representation, we pass each image through a pre-trained ResNet 50, uh, and this gives us a reasonably sized feature map output. This is a fairly standard thing to do now with uh, CNNs. But because we also have eye data for each training image, we needed some way to integrate these fixations with the visual input because, remember, each of these fixations is changing the state. And, uh, and what we came up with is something that we're calling a cumulative retina transformation. This involves first computing a retina transformed image, which is an image that is blurred to approximate the loss of resolution that occurs in the visual periphery. So our model has this simple foveated retina. Then, as its name suggests, uh, we simply accumulate these high resolution foveal views over multiple fixations. So each fixation, in a sense, progressively de-blurs what is initially a pretty blurred image. To define the action space for our model, we discretized the ret image input into this grid of cells, which we then uh, prioritized by the uh, saccade map that I told you about, in order to select one of these 160 possible locations uh, for the uh, saccade. So this is the um, uh, resolution of the action, so to speak. Now let's shift to the results, and I'll start with the uh, behavioral test data that we're uh, trying to explain and predict. Here is the cumulative probability of subjects fixated the target as a function of their saccade serial position. First, second, third, etc. The top two lines are the fixation probabilities on the microwave and clock targets, uh, and the bottom lines are two non-target object baselines that capture uh, chance performance, and that I'm not going to get into now. The big takeaway uh, from this, though, is that the targets were far more likely to be fixated than chance, with the slopes of these lines indicating the strength of this guidance. So this tells us that we have a nice, strong attention control signal in the data uh, to try to predict. And now I'll uh, tell you about how well our model was able to make these predictions. Uh, starting with a qualitative analysis, you can get a better sense for uh, what it's doing. Uh, here are two RET images uh, with the microwave target indicated in red. The, the top image was computed based on the center initial fixation position, uh, which is why it's kind of blurry on the left and right sides and the bottom image uh, was computed based on the landing position of the first saccade. These are the corresponding saccade maps. 
uh, which, uh, remember, are the model's priority maps. Uh, and what they are showing is the amount of total reward that's expected by fixating different locations, with bluer signaling greater reward. Uh, so the model thought that the greatest reward would be received by fixating the stove here, but uh, after making that eye movement and the resulting change in state, the model then expected greater reward from the microwave target, which was selected to be fixated next. Here's another qualitative analysis, uh, this time showing fixation density maps for our model and the uh, 60 subjects. What's interesting here is that the model and subjects seem to search the scenes differently depending on what they were searching for, the target type. So when they were looking for a microwave, they tended to look at the countertops, and when searching for a clock, they tended to look higher up on the walls. And um, we're just intensely interested in uh, the prospect of predicting these effects of scene context uh, on search in uh, future work. Here's how well our model was able to predict these behavioral fixation density maps using two popular metrics. Higher values for each indicate better predictive success. Note that there's also a subject model, which we computed using leave one out, uh, and this provides a, a practical noise limit on the model's ability to predict group behavior. And what this shows is that our model did a good job in uh, predicting the fixation density maps, at least according to AUC. Uh, where these predictions were about as good as you can expect based on the subject model. Okay, uh, fixation density maps, however, are uh, purely spatial, but uh, search uh, fixations are also made over time, ultimately uh, producing a scan path. Because our model also makes sequences of fixations, we were able to compare its scan paths uh, to those of our subjects. And as you can see, uh, based on average uh, multi-match similarity, the model did a pretty good job. You know, predicting scan paths is not the easiest thing to do, so this may be one of the more impressive results that I'm uh, showing you today. Finally, we looked at accuracy and search efficiency. Uh, note that all of these measures are based on only the first six saccades made during search. Uh, and um, that's because the model only generated six saccades for uh, computational reasons. Accuracy, therefore, refers to the uh, proportion of trials in which the target was fixated in the first six eye movements. And uh, average saccades refers to the mean number of saccades needed to find the target on those accurate trials. Scan path ratio is just the sum saccade vector distance divided by the distance between starting fixation and the target. And what this shows is that the bottle was a bit less successful than our subjects in locating the target in six uh, saccades. But when it did find the target, it tended to do so about as efficiently as our subjects, needing only half a fixation more and only in the case of clocks. To get a better look at this, here's the cumulative probability of fixation plot that I showed you uh, earlier, which is perhaps the clearest measure of search efficiency. And here's the plot with the model behavior added in. Note that the model is generally lower, uh, reflecting the difference in uh, fixated in six accuracy, but otherwise, its saccades are guided to the targets very much like the behavior of our subjects. And this means that it, like our subjects, was reflecting this uh, a very strong goal-specific attention control. By the way, if you have a model and think it could do better, feel free to uh, download our training and testing data sets and have a go at it. Uh, but remember, no peeking at the test data. That's not allowed in prediction. I'm uh, over time, I guess. Uh, so uh, let me uh, very quickly wrap things up. Uh, we showed that a model driven by total expected reward could predict the goal-directed control of attention as measured by the saccades made in the search for two target categories. This means that it's now possible to learn the reward functions that define target category goals. In future work, we plan to manipulate uh, different types of reward and, ex and explore their combinations. For example, how would the uh, predictive success of a model trained on short-term immediate reward uh, compared to the current model, which was trained on total expected reward? We're gearing up to do this, as well as to answer some uh, questions in individual difference learning. But probably the big biggest single factor uh, underlying the success of our model is the creation of uh, the microwave clock uh, search data set, which is uh, one of the only data sets of goal-directed attention large enough to train deep net models. But uh, don't forget, as I already mentioned, uh, another major effort in our lab is the creation of Coco Search 10, uh, which will be over 10 times the size. Uh, so you're going to want to stay tuned for that one. 
I'd like to thank Yu Pei Chen and So Young Un, two absolutely amazing PhD students in psychology. Uh, Hossein Adeli, my former amazing PhD student, and uh, Lihan uh, Yang and uh, uh, um, Jibo Yang and Lihan Wong, uh, two PhD students in uh, computer science. I'd also like to thank my colleagues in computer vision and machine learning at Stony Brook, uh, the people in the iCloud lab who helped with this project, our uh, generous sponsor, and most importantly, you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. So if we have time for one quick question uh, while the next yeah. presenter please sets up. Uh -huh. Hi, that's uh, really interesting. And uh, one thing I'm excited about is if I understand it, because you're maximizing some future reward, it's, it's going to do things like choose to saccade places, not just where it might find the clock, but might help it get there next time. Exactly. And I think that's yeah. very different from like the Geisler work and kind of the classic, you know, rational search, which is all greedy at each step, to my knowledge. Yeah. Is that playing a role in the data? Is that a, is that a real factor or is it, does it matter? Uh, this is that, uh, that question that I said we're going to address next in future work, <laughs> comparing a, 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 a immediate reward to the current model using total expected reward. From what we can look, from what I can glean so far, uh, um, the predictions of a, um, the SCAD maps for models trained on a, a greedy reward uh, are similar in the sense that they have the same hotspots, but they're broader. Uh, so the total expected reward, I think, is uh, resulting in more spatially tuned predictions that are more accurate. Can I ask one very quick question? I'm sure, sorry. Hi, yeah. up here. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. In the in the uh, sequential saccades, you're not showing up here. Hi. Oh. Hi. Um, you're not showing any degradation of the information due to like you know a decay of iconic memory or anything like that, right? And so I was wondering if the efficiency might be maximized or better matching the human performance if you were to basically make the model forget as it makes more saccades. Um, you're right, our, our model doesn't have that, uh, that decay function uh, in it as yet. In, uh, so in, in the sense, it's optimal in the case that it's holding all of its uh, previous, uh, previously acquired state information. Uh, as for whether adding a decay would better predict performance, I kind of think not, because it's already lower than human performance in its accuracy of uh, of uh, acquiring a target in six saccades. Sure, but it might encourage it to make fewer saccades, and then it might learn a different way of, of maximizing that fit uh, between the, the trajectory of saccades um, across time. Anyway. Yeah, it's possible. It's okay. difficult to predict the behavior of these things sometimes <laughs> until you actually try it. But, but thank you for the suggestion. Great, thanks.